The first model we have, of course, is the Tabernacle of Moses. This is the first complete model of a dwelling place, a holy place of God. The second model is Solomon's Temple. And this model itself went through at least three different phases. Solomon's Temple, uh, Ezra's Temple, and then, of course, Herod's Temple. But one that is virtually unknown, and that is Ezekiel's futuristic temple. Now here is a temple that occupied a big chunk of Ezekiel that was never fulfilled. And yet the resemblances to some other material elsewhere in the Bible is extremely intriguing. Now for a very long period of my life, I believed, because that's what I was taught, that the pattern Moses was given is a structural pattern. By that I mean it's an architectural pattern. It had to do with the physical structure. But this is ignoring information in numbers. When we get to numbers too, we discover that the pattern was not simply about that tent itself. It's about how life must be organized around the tent. So it was an organizational, not just a structural pattern. And this is the organizational structure. The tent, the tabernacle, the sanctuary, right in the middle. And then right next to it, in front were the priests and their families, and Moses, and then around it were the three clans of Levites. So the Merorites, the Gershonites, and the Kohathites. There were only three clans in Israel, all the Levites, which means that this tent, first of all, had a fence all around it, so you could not enter the fence except through one entrance point. And then it had a second ring of protection, the Levites and then the priests themselves. And then the tribes were organized in groups of three, three tribes here, three tribes here, three here, three here. This is east, north, south, and west. And in each of these grouping, a leading tribe was assigned. So Judah was the leading tribe, Dan was the leading tribe, Ephraim was the leading tribe, and Reuben was the leading tribe. When I first came to realize that this underneath this pattern God gave Israel was about the organization of the camp, not just the structure of the tent. It gave me new eyes to the book of Revelation because we see a similar pattern of life organized around the throne of God in the book of Revelation as well. But we shall have a look at that a little bit later. Now the implication that was given to Moses was this, that all space within this red line, that means the entire camp of Israel, the Levites, the priests, the tent itself, these were all considered holy space. So this entire thing is holy space. And holy persons live in holy space. And you will see the New Testament simply amplifies this to incorporate the, the whole world as the holy space of God. However, it also taught Israel that there are varying degrees of holiness. So out here in the camp, that's the lightest degree of holiness. Holy of holies, that's the heaviest degree of holiness. So as you go inwards, you meet increasing degrees of holiness until you reach the holy of holies. And by the same token, starting from the holy of holies, you move outwards, the spaces become less holy, the people become less holy, until you meet the, the lightest element. So all Israel was holy, but not as holy as the priests and Levites. This space was holy, this was a little bit more holy, but not as holy as the court, and yet that was still open enough for everyone. This was too holy for everyone, so only the priests and the Levites sometimes could enter. This one, way too holy, and so only the high priest could ever go in there. And so the tabnit, the structure, was intended to convey this concept. All space under God is holy, but within that space there are varying degrees of holiness, God himself being the holiest of all. Briefly through the other models, Solomon's temple, here's the intriguing thing. When uh, David gave instructions to Solomon to build the temple, 
He told Solomon that you must build it according to the tablet that God gave me. Same language as in Exodus, but there were major differences with Moses' tabernacle. For one thing, size. Moses' tabernacle was big, but it was really small compared to Solomon's temple. There were multiple furnishings. The only one that the only ones that were not multiple furnishings were the Ark of the Covenant and the altar for sacrifice. And there were unique features in Solomon's temple that were not part of the original tabernacle. Keep this in mind, both David and Moses were told to build according to Tabneel. So did David see a different Tabneel than the one Moses saw? Well, no. Because the three-part structure of this temple, called the first temple, is the same. There's the outer court, there is the holy place, and there's the most holy place. But notice what Solomon did. He built extra rooms, storage rooms all around it. He had two pillars that he built, he even named them. He had this gigantic tank that was so big, it was called the sea. And then he had smaller tanks all along the sides. So it was a quite different. He had 10 menorahs, 10 tables. Uh, we don't know how many of the incense he had. There were steps in here. The doors were wooden. The walls were marble, stone. Solomon's tabernacle, I mean Solomon's temple was a solid, immovable structure. Moses' tabernacle was portable. It was a tent. But later on this temple was destroyed. It was rebuilt and then enlarged and added upon by Herod. And this was the temple that Jesus saw. Jesus and the disciples. It's known to us as Herod's temple and this is considered the second temple period. When the Romans destroyed this temple, it was never rebuilt. One of the great controversies in the Jewish world uh, or Israel's world today is the desire of some Christian groups and some Jewish groups to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. Unfortunately, there is the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock Muslim shrines on that same Temple Mount. And if any attempt is made to build a temple there, it would involve destroying those shrines and that would lead to a Third World War for sure. And this is why some Christians believe that's exactly what will precipitate the second coming of Jesus. So it still comes back to this temple in some ways. Ezekiel also saw a temple. About uh, one third of his book is about this temple. It also had unique features. It talked about rivers and trees lining its banks. This is more like the New Jerusalem. It talks about trees that bear fruit, different fruit monthly, again in Revelation. It talks about 12 gates with the names of 12 tribes. Well, by the time of Herod, there were multiple gates around the temple. I'm not sure there were 12, but multiple gates. But in the tabernacle, there was just one entrance point. Now, as far as we know, this prediction of Ezekiel was never completed. But the features that reappear in Revelation tells us that maybe it's completely proleptic or eschatological. It was not meant to be rebuilt. But it also had the three-part structure. There was the open space out here. There was the bigger room here. And then the inner sanctum over here. The one common feature of these models is that the inner sanctum is a cube. So the Holy Ho of Holies is a cube. And the only other cube, geometric cube in the Bible is the New Jerusalem in Revelation. But we shall deal with that later. What we also see in Ezekiel, similar to Moses in the book of Numbers, is an arrangement of life more or less around the temple. So here is the temple in the middle. Priests and Levites live around it. The citizens uh, who live in the city, that's a different structure here. The prince and his household, and we are not told who the prince is, would live here. And then outside that would be the tribal lands. So it's a very similar structure to what we find in Numbers. So clearly Tabneed, the sanctuary, the tabernacle is more than just that tent or that temple. 
You know that after Solomon built the Temple of Jerusalem, the entire life and history of that nation and its religion became completely centered on that temple. And when that temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, the Jews in exile thought that the covenant itself had been taken away from them. That is what the impact of these things really mean on, on them. Okay, so what have we seen? There are multiple models, three main ones, about the sanctuary. But all of them share the same three-part structure. So there's something about the number three and then the number seven that appear over and over in these structures. And then this, all space and time around is holy. And so Israel is holy because they were in a holy place. And later on we will see that even time in relationship to this sanctuary is holy. Of course some Sabbath keepers think that time is holy only on Shabbat. That is not what the sanctuary teaches. Human life has two governing parameters, time and space. And the presence of God makes both time and space holy. And therefore, the tabernacle was intended to show that everything God touches, that you can see with your eyes in how it works in that model, all of that is holy. So the people, the time, and so on.